District of Conservation is sponsored by the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, better known as CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to CFACT.org. Thanks for listening to the program. This episode is brought to you by Experian. Are you paying for subscriptions you don't use, but can't find the time or energy to cancel them? Experian could cancel unwanted subscriptions for you, saving you an average of $270 per year and plenty of time. Download the Experian app. Results will vary. Not all subscriptions are eligible. Savings are not guaranteed. Paid membership with connected payment account required. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. We have another episode for you this week on the continuing theme, I believe, for this week on District of Conservation, incompetent bureaucrats who oversee large departments and mishandle them or espouse really bizarre views. Yesterday, we focused on the Department of Interior and that really bizarre story out of Denali National Park. I'm going to focus my efforts and fire, metaphorically speaking, on Pete Buttigieg, who is the Transportation Secretary, and two bizarre news stories that involve him in the matter of the last couple of days. One involving electric vehicles, and the other with him echoing this talking point that climate change or the climate change crisis is worsening turbulence on airplanes. Sounds like something out of the Onion or Babylon Bee, but it's not. This is reality. So let's break down these two stories very quickly on the show for you today. I was doing my best to enjoy the holiday weekend because I have, unfortunately, I must confess, worked a little bit on weekends in recent months, and I shouldn't be doing that. That should not be happening. But I had to, in anticipation of several trips, so I could enjoy those trips and get ahead on some work and stay on schedule. But I really tried to value my Memorial Day weekend. I got to do some fun activities, discover new things, got to see different light of D.C. and just the Potomac River. I was trying not to be on social media throughout the weekend that much. Yesterday on Memorial Day, as I was preparing to devise, you know, what type of content I want for the week, I stumbled upon a clip of Secretary Buttigieg being confronted by one of the news anchors about why there have only been after $7.5 billion from a 2020 one bipartisan infrastructure bill, why have there only been seven or eight federally managed, federally overseen EV charging stations out of the 500,000 that are supposed to be constructed by 2030? Why have they failed to deploy EV charging stations? And I want to read the exchange for you because we don't want to borrow the clips necessarily. I always am so afraid of copyright infringement. So I will read for you what the exchange was between Secretary Buttigieg and CBS Face the Nation host Margaret Brenner. I was surprised to see in watching the clip that she was actually pressing him to clarify or to explain why this has been so poorly implemented. Not surprising. I will add my commentary later, but I was really impressed to see this because the American press on these issues on energy and environment is extremely soft or unfortunately they're extremely co-opted. That's, that's the other alternative, or they're too afraid to rock the boat, or for some outlets, they publicly disclose that they're getting EV money or clean energy money, so that's what's influencing their reporting. I'll include the link to the full clip for you to watch, but here's what the exchange looked like. So Brennan had asked him, you know, why haven't you and your administration fully catalyzed, you know, EV charging stations and getting 500,000 or anywhere near 500,000? And here is what Secretary Buttigieg said. Now, in order to do a charger, it's more than just plugging a small device into the ground, he said. There's utility work, and this is also really a new category of federal investment, but we've been working with each of the 50 states. Then Margaret Brennan proceeds to ask seven or eight, though, with a laugh, and then I'm reading this from Fox Business. Again, by 2030, 500,000 chargers, Buttigieg said, and the very first handful of chargers are now already being physically built. And this stems from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, a massive infrastructure project Biden signed in 2021, earmarking, as I mentioned, I'm reading this from Fox Business, $7.5 billion for EV charging programs, while the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act, the Green New Deal light, let's be honest, expands tax credits for EVs and charger installations. 
So according to AutoWeek, only eight EV charging stations from this $7.5 billion infrastructure project bill from 2021. So in nearly three years since the bill has been adopted, where has that $7.5 billion gone to? Only eight charging stations? Seriously? You have to wonder, is someone getting some kickbacks from this? Like, who's benefiting financially from this? That's a question we should be asking. And not surprisingly, in the private sector side, you see more charging stations installed without the help of federal funding. That's to be seen. But I don't really see them used that much, to be honest. Like, anytime I travel or I'm on the road, you see a lot of empty EV charging stalls. You see the gas stalls filled with crowds of people sometimes, not so much EVs. And this falls into the greater trends of people just really not warming up to electric vehicle catalyzation. You see few Americans rushing to buy an EV car, especially with the really nice added $7,500 credit if the EV you want is still qualifying for it. And there's a lot of problems to these EV subsidies. The true cost of an EV, if you don't know, is ultimately $50,000, according to the Texas Public Policy Foundation. So even with the subsidies, the true cost of the car has been severely altered and is misrepresented um, because of just how heavily subsidized it is. And then you also have to call into question what goes into sourcing EVs. Are they truly American-made as Biden and his administration and Secretary Buttigieg are claiming to be the case? No, most of these rare earth elements are sourced from Outside of the United States, China dominates rare earth elements and the processing side and development side and the harnessing side. So it will never be truly American run and especially dictated by the free market. This is the federal government subsidizing the EV industry and forcing industry to follow dictates from the federal government. And the fact that they can't deploy EV charging stations as a basic standard goes to show that this EV forced by the EPA rule, the tailpipe rule for light, medium, and heavy-duty cars. Never going to be fully realized, thank goodness, because people don't like EV mandates. They're like, well, it's not a mandate. It is a mandate. You're forcing producers to have to convert much of their products to be EVs by 20, you know, some 20-something arbitrary deadline. You need two-thirds of your vehicle fleet, new fleet, to be EVs. And then if you're tied to California's vehicle emission standards, you have to follow California's dictate, which says all your EVs by 2035, 2045, I believe, have to be fully EV. doesn't matter. Like everything ultimately has to be that. And Virginia, unfortunately, is stuck in that compact because Governor Youngkin cannot get us out of that because the General Assembly, which is slightly Democrat, will never undo that. So we're kind of locked in this in Virginia unless there's some lawsuits or whatnot, but our governor wanted to get us out of it. We can't. So ultimately, everyone will feel the brunt of this mandate. And I don't have any confidence. Let's say, like I said, hypothetically speaking, even if this were to be viable, the fact that the government can't construct EV charging stations with all those billions of dollars, how are they going to enforce that EV mandate from the EPA? It's going to be poorly implemented. You're not going to see much of compliance. You're going to see probably a lot of manufacturers, especially non-unionized ones, sue the administration, sue the EPA to block this rule from going into effect if lawsuits have not already been filed. I know they have, from my understanding and my reading into it. And so, of course, there's a failure for this to launch. And good on Margaret Brennan for challenging and taking the secretary to task. He was doubling down. I'm like, oh, this is so great. You just haven't seen it yet. This is a new type of way that government spending is appropriated in a new program. No, it's not. EVs have been subsidized before under the Obama administration, again, under Biden. So, Please don't tell us this is a new way of government appropriating money. Whenever the government appropriates spending, it always goes awry. It never works because the federal government shouldn't be picking winners and losers. It shouldn't be dictating industries and dictating outcomes for industries, no matter how much they wish cast everyone to have an EV. The public doesn't want it. Public polling after public polling shows it's extremely unpopular to force EVs on people. You want an EV? Get it for yourself. Don't take the subsidy because it's all on us. We're paying for it, the taxpayer. And so if there's a true market interest in it, maybe it'll come online. People like Tesla's, great. But there's no market orientation for EVs right now. I don't see this happening whatsoever. They're sitting on car lots. Car dealers are very frustrated about these EVs piling up. 
and nobody, again, anecdotally speaking, I travel all over the country. I do a lot of road trips. I don't see people lining up to charge EVs. And whenever they do, there's always failures about the EV charging stations not working, even from the private side. Could you imagine the federal government gets in this business because this technology is not fully realized or ready for prime time? Oh, it's going to be a disaster. So that's my thought on that. Let's move on to this next Pete Buttigieg story about turbulence and climate change, because as a frequent flyer, oh gosh, I've experienced turbulence. I think a lot of us have experienced turbulence, but can climate change truly explain it? Let's get to the root of this issue, if this is the case. Oh my gosh. So also in this conversation on Face the Nation, I forgot that he actually commented on this in addition to his EV comments with Margaret Brennan. He says, quote, this is from CNBC, the reality is the effects of climate change are already upon us In terms of our transportation, he told Face the Nation on Sunday, forecasting that turbulence is something that we will continue, that will continue to, quote, affect American travelers, whether here or abroad. We've seen that in the form of everything from heat waves that shouldn't statistically even be possible, threatening to melt the cables of transit systems in the Pacific Northwest to, as you mentioned, hurricane season becoming more and more extreme. That's not true. And indications that turbulence is up by 15 percent, he continued. That means assessing anything and everything that we can do about it. And he is taking this viewpoint or developing, had developed this viewpoint from a study published in the Geophysical Research Letters found last year that there have been increases in clear air turbulence cat between 1979 and 2020 with, quote, severe or greater, end quote, turbulence, the strongest category of cat, becoming 55% more frequent over the North Atlantic over the course of that time period, Buttigieg continues, our climate is evolving, our policies and our technology and our infrastructure have to evolve accordingly too. And this is stemming from a Qatar Airways flight from Doha to Dublin. There was also that Singapore flight where one person died and some others were injured. So let's see if this is actually true, if you can actually make the connection between turbulence and climate change. I'm reading from the Free Press, which is a great publication And apparently this talking point about the frequency of turbulence being more prevalent and this so-called relation to climate change, some expert, Rupa Subramaniam, in the free press actually debunked this. And I'm also going to cite Ryan Maui, who I think is one of the most trustworthy climatologists. He specializes in weather reports, and he's a serious person. He studies climate. He can tell you what explains and is explained by climate change or not. But let's read this. Free Press article. So this individual writes, stop making plain turbulence about climate change. And he goes on to continue that the American government has bought into this narrative even before the Singapore Airlines incident. On May 16th, President Joe Biden signed into law a bipartisan bill to reauthorize the Federal Aviation Administration, which includes the Severe Turbulence Research and Development Act. Representative Haley Stevens, who introduced the bill, told Congress, quote, turbulence is an increasing problem as weather becomes more unpredictable due to climate change. But what does the science say? The Free Press writer adds, by far the most prominent scientist making the case is Paul Williams, a professor of atmospheric science at Reading University in the UK. All the pieces mentioned before above reference his work, which uses mathematical models to predict how climate change will affect clear air turbulence, that is turbulence that you can't see coming. This is kind of turbulence. This kind of turbulence, excuse me, is caused by wind speed rather than clouds. In 2017, he co-authored a study that received a lot of attention because it predicted that a rise in atmospheric CO2 could double or even triple incidences of severe clear air turbulence. He also published a much publicized paper in 2022 arguing that wind speeds over the North Atlantic had increased in the last few decades, the basis for arguing that clear air turbulence will get worse. And in another widely projected paper, published in 2023, Williams predicted a 55% increase in clear air turbulence over the North Atlantic. Williams had also developed an aviation turbulence forecasting algorithm, which is widely used, including in the U.S., and has received an award from the British government. But how solid is his link between clear air turbulence and climate change? Earlier this year, Williams co-authored a letter to the Quarterly Journal of the Royal Meteorological Society, which walked back the findings of his 2022 paper. Even if we if we include new data, the later explained, the increase in wind speeds above the North Atlantic ceases to be statistically significant. As is often the case, whether the subject of a study is vaccines or mental illness, the retraction received far less attention from the press than the original claim. Besides, Williams' research is almost entirely focused on clear air turbulence over the North Atlantic, 
Can it really offer insight into the Singapore Airlines incident? Pilots aren't so sure. Mark Hoffmeyer, a Qantas pilot and vice president of the Australian and International Pilots Association, told journalists he believes that thunderstorms, which cause, quote, convective turbulence, end quote, were the likely cause of the incident rather than clear air turbulence. Another pilot confirmed this, that turbulence is a common problem in the area with the arrival of powerful monsoons this time of year. And there are some more claims. So the author, this is where Ryan Maui comes in. Williams has claimed that rising CO2 levels will increase turbulence hasn't been proven. It is based on a mathematical projection. You can't rule out the possibility that, that is right, says Ryan Maui, a private sector weather scientist who worked in the Trump administration, but we're not there yet. When I spoke to him, Maui pointed out that the incidence of injuries on airplanes caused by air turbulence has actually come down over the years, despite the fact that air travel has increased exponentially over the last half century. If climate change is making the skies bumpier, Maui added, any increased risk, risk will be likely mitigated by improvements in technology, for instance, increasing sophisticated weather prediction software, which he expects will be even better with AI. I recognize that climate change is real, of course. I can look at the data just like everybody else, Maui told the Free Press, but he isn't on board with the doom and gloom scenario that dominates the media. And let's see what Ryan had said in a series of tweets about this, because I believe I retweeted him. So quote tweeting the Face the Nation tweet, featuring Secretary Buttigieg. Ryan says, for some reason, the media, climate activists, and politicians on the left want you to be afraid of flying. Instead of reassuring the public at every turn, the narrative is to ramp up irrational fear and anxiety. Another quote from Ryan says, you can't fight the misinformation, so just embrace the suck. Yet another severe climate-fueled turbulence episode, this time over Turkey on Qatar Airways flight. Mayor Pete blames climate change for increased turbulence up 15%. He adds another tweet, of course, blaming climate change for administration or industry failures has been Mayor Pete's political strategy for the past four years. Boeing will gladly blame climate change for whatever calamity awaits. I also want to point out a blog post from Mark Morano, the publisher of Climate Depot, who used to work in the Senate on energy and environment issues, pointed out in a blog post that according to a report from the International Civil Aviation Organization, there has been no crease in the accidents or injuries of airplane travel due to turbulence that one would expect if air conditions were worsening. And he includes a chart we will include in the show notes. What the data actually shows, in fact, is that although air traffic and the number of passengers has increased dramatically, there has been no upward trend in increasing turbulence-related accidents over the past 30 years. Mayor Pete is not a scientist, so I will take whatever he says at face value, but the fact that he bungled EVs and turbulence, not a good look for him. This individual had bragged about, oh, we have to limit our reliance on gas-powered cars, and he was caught on camera coming out of an SUV a block or two away from his agency, the Department of Transportation, in a bike. What a hypocrite. So I don't trust whatever comes out of his mouth, and the fact that he couldn't concede that the EV catalyzation plan from the DOT is not working, incompetence abounds at all these agencies because they put climate change or fighting climate change above practicality and above consumer demand and above public lands access. Like I said, we're seeing a pattern across all these agencies that have to deal with energy, conservation, environment. And whenever they have overlap or wherever they try to create overlap, they get captured ideologically, whether it is under Secretary Buttigieg or Secretary Holland or this National Park Service superintendent, they all put ideology above the science. So it's not surprising to me that he bungled Secretary Buttigieg, he bungled EVs, and he put this misinformation about turbulence in the age of increased travel. So I feel much more reassured hearing that there are numerous studies debunking this. I think you will be too. But this alarmism does not do any service for conservation. It's these acolytes and extremists who are really beholden to this net zero at all costs philosophy, Buttigieg is, Holland is, all these people are, and it doesn't matter what happens or if it's more expensive or if it's not feasible. They put ideology over practicality, and that is why people are souring on this administration, why you see their numbers on these issues in particular are historically down. People don't have trust in this administration, especially when they gaslight them and tell them, well, our energy policies are working. Well, our conservation policies, we're still maintaining public lands access. We're not going to force you to get an EV, but we're still putting a mandate through the EPA to make it so producers who ultimately pass down their burdens onto consumers, 
You're not going to feel any impact. Yes, you are. You're going to feel the impact of these EV mandates and you're going to hopefully ignore this misinformation about air travel and this fear mongering about air travel because you're not likely going to encounter turbulence as much. Like I can tell you having flown a lot of flights, a couple dozen over the last few years, do not be afraid to fly. And not surprisingly, Buttigieg and company don't want us to fly because it also contributes to the climate crisis or we're emitting too much in emissions, but they can still drive a car. They can still fly. But the rest of us, us peasants, we can't. So this is the conclusion of this week in hypocrisy from the Biden administration across all these agencies. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. If you enjoyed what you heard today, go leave us some reviews on Apple and Spotify or wherever podcasts are played. Your feedback will help us reach more people. And I love to know what is on your mind after each episode. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to never miss a beat or a guest announcement because that is our way of updating all of you listeners. And we have just hit a thousand followers on Instagram for the podcast account. Thank you very much. And if you have any guest suggestions or topics you want to hear on the show, I'm all ears. I would love to hear your feedback there. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode.